All right, so today I have my good friend Paco Nathan, and we're here to talk about the AI conference, uh, the first AI conference, which took place in San Francisco, September 26 and 27. And we're having this discussion at a time when the videos for the talks of the conference are already out. So Paco, as always, welcome back to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Great to be here. That was a really fantastic conference. So today, I think our format will be focused on takeaways that uh, we noticed at the conference. So I'll I'll do a takeaway, Paco will react, and then Paco will do a takeaway, and then I'll react. So let me start. So my first takeaway, Paco, is a meta takeaway, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, as, as many people know, machine learning and AI, to a large extent, they're empirical disciplines. So a lot of uh, a lot of my ma main observation in the conference is, uh, especially when it comes to large language models, uh, we're all in the situation where we're still exploring, we're still trying to figure out how to use these things, what works, what doesn't. So a lot of the uh, takeaways that we're going to talk about are kind of empirical standards in the sense that uh, there's no theorems here. It's mostly people are trying things and then they're sh sharing to each other what they're learning. So uh, Paco, do you agree with kind of this assessment that uh, there were a lot of people who, who who their talk and their slides would say, okay, so this is what we learned. And it was basically the result of experiments that they and their team conducted. I, I agree. And I, you know, I'd also say that the more empirical the results were, um, it tended to be the more that it resonated with the audience. I mean, you could, you definitely could get a feel of seeing uh, a speaker getting swamped on their way down the stairs <laughs> off the stage and then, you know, being swamped out in the hallway while they're trying to go over to office hours. Um, and I, I could think of a few talks where, yeah, they, they, they brought out really great empirical evidence and, and it really showed, um, I think that, you know, while uh, at any scale, um, I think also the Roxit talk was a very similar kind of case. It's where people maybe are bringing up something that's a bit different than the conventional wisdom that's that's in the headlines, uh, but yet they show the empirical support for it, and people are like, "Aha! Okay, this is a way to go after in business." And I guess the the main thing I want to emphasize this to our listeners is, don't feel bad if you're try uh, uh, experimenting, you know, uh, trial and error. So, because a lot of the uh, leading teams in the space that's precisely what they're doing right Paco? yeah yeah definitely uh yeah i mean it's it's just such early days there's a lot of different models uh obviously there's a lot of possible permutations of how to combine things um i i think part of the the empirical focus or the experimental focus on this that i really see that the thing that i've heard over and over was you know while on the one hand there's a lot of new cycle items about some great api some huge model it takes over everything else uh the reality was that people were experimenting with combinations of of models and that was getting a lot a lot better results and a lot better traction a lot better economics so uh i think that the, the experimentation ahead and also just the the range of use cases, uh, I, I think, is really startling, and so yeah, it, it, it begs a lot of experimentation. So, all right. So, Paco, what about you? What's your first takeaway? Um, well, also kind of a meta takeaway before we get into like specific talks or technologies was just the uh, the demographics were startling. Um, you know, this this conference sold out real real early. And when uh, Roger Chen at one point uh, was was moderating a panel of VCs and had taken an informal poll in the in the larger room about you know, just basically age and what stage people were at in their careers, and it, it roughly it was like five percent were maybe fresh out, um, and maybe twenty percent were sort of my crowd, you know, like late fifties and older, um, which is actually. Strange. And and then probably about half the people uh, were uh, mid-range, you know, uh, career professionals in their 40s, let's say. Um, that's a really big demographic shift for what we would usually see for uh, especially a conference in San Francisco where you've got a lot of, you know, younger professionals. I would have expected to see a lot of a lot more people in like 20s and 30s. Um, but when I talked uh, 
uh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience was, but when I was talking with, you know, random people coming up with questions, um, it did seem to be a lot of business folks from other regions who had seen the conference, bought a ticket immediately and flown in. Um, be, and they're not really in AI, but they need to learn about it. Yeah. So there were a lot of people from all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there who, who were tasked with the, uh, trying to come up with an AI strategy for their organization, right? Uh, yeah, I, I did notice a lot of that. By the way, Paco, since you hosted this talk, in Walid's talk, I don't know exactly the exact phrasing of the question, but he did ask how many people were already in production with LLMs, I think. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was, uh, what was the metric there? You know, was, I, I... It wasn't high, right? No, I, I would say that that was probably more of like a 10 to 20 percent, somewhere in that range. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Walid uh, Kedus from any scale, chief scientist in any scale, uh, did a talk called LLMs in Production, Learning from Experience. Um, and a, 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 I think that that talk had the, the, the most incredible audience response. Uh, like you're saying, it, it was very empirical and it was showing about the economics. We can go into that one in a later, later bit, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then uh, uh, I, on the demographic side, the other observation I have is that uh, there were a lot of also investor types. So obviously we had the VC panels, but in the audience were a lot of investors as well, right? It, it definitely did seem that way. And uh, yeah, certainly like investors from VCs, but also a fair amount of people from institutional kinds of, of funding, um, a fair amount of people from government agencies uh, who are coming in, different kinds, or, you know, maybe from uh, analysis watchdog, like Atlantic Council, for instance, uh, you know, different different people involved in governance more so than, let's say, uh, some particular technology. All right. So now my second takeaway take is um, uh, maybe more specific, which is... Uh, Open source foundation models are in the mix. So a lot of the talks, obviously uh, this kind of uh, resurgence and excitement in AI was fueled with the release of ChatGPT in November. And uh, for a while, I think people used OpenAI's API, but now more and more people are using uh, open source models. So for example, Anyscale has a, uh, an endpoint which relies mainly on open source or exclusively on open source models. So open source models are in the mix, but then to me, Paco, that brings up two questions uh, that I've been grappling with. And uh, the first is, uh, what is open source in the context of LLMs, right? So obviously we have the license, you have to have the right license. But uh, beyond that, uh, uh, what exactly do you need to make available? Obviously the model weights and enough information that people can... Uh, uh, recreate, uh, recreate your model or reproduce your results and things like this. So, so there's this notion of what is open source, uh, so that uh, the people can build on each other's work. And is that uh, mapping over to the world of foundation models? I think we kind of know what we mean by open source in traditional software. And then the second thing, Paco, that uh, brings uh, uh, that brings to mind when I notice that open source is in the mix, and this is something that uh, uh, bothers me a little bit, is that uh, for the most part, I think open source right now, honestly, uh, most people when they say open source models refer to Meta Slama family of models, right? So because those are the best open source models right now. There are other open source models, but uh, probably the most efficient and uh, best, uh, most performant models are these meta open source models. But let's set that aside. Let's say there's sure. two or three other suppliers. Sure. We still are in a position as a community where we're dependent on a few suppliers and these suppliers can change the license in future versions. So, so I guess uh, to yeah. summarize, Open source models are in the mix. I I want to know if we understand exactly what we mean by open source foundation models. And then secondly, are we kind of uh, in a position, putting ourselves in a position where uh, we're dependent on a handful of suppliers? 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, well, obviously, one of the biggest takeaways that that I saw along these lines at the conference and and I think throughout industry is that you know hugging face is just such an amazing uh, force for good. Let's put it that way. Um, they're they're extremely supportive of a lot of uh, smaller teams that are doing uh, really interesting or, or critical uh, functions. Um, they've it appears that Hugging Face has been very deliberately and strategically going after what are the missing pieces for an open source community uh, or ecosystem to exist, and then you know systematically putting these in place. Um, and I also really appreciated that just the Hugging Face talks, you know, even even going to like. I, I don't mean to get pedagogical, but obviously that's some of my background. But like looking at the design of slides between different speakers, you got a real sense of hugging face. They put a lot of effort into making their stuff understandable and clear, and being very supportive of, of the the uh, you know the whole community. Um, and I mean, you look at hugging face right now. As of October, um, there's what three hundred fifty thousand models uh, that they have. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better with like uh, uh, Mistral coming out. Uh, so, I mean, there there are competitors to Llama, which, you know, appear to beat the benchmarks over Llama and also are smaller. Um, so so the, I, main, I think... the main characteristic is that uh, our open source models are being supplied by companies. I, I wonder if that's going to be a, well, it, a problem for us moving forward. Yeah, so I mean, I think that that had been some of the the early characterization of this. Um, I know that OSI is working very much on trying to get a definition for what does it mean to have an open source model? Because you're right, it it has to do with like, do we have the weights and biases? Do we understand what the license is? I mean, I think Hugging Face has done very well to make that transparent across the different selections. Um, the other thing is like, where did the data come from? And are there potential gotchas down the road uh, if you're going and using this beyond what the license may say or cover, or there are things that you might run into later. Um, and I think, you know, people are finding that out to be as, as, as regulatory concerns are being defined, uh, there may be gotchas down the road. You need to understand that. Um, I think, you know, OSI was the group that really made the formal definition for legally, what is open source? What are those models? Yeah, because uh, tra traditionally, traditionally, Paco, I guess what we think of open source in, in many ways is I uh, want to yeah. be able to use it, improve it, learn from it so so those are kind of the ingredients that uh, so in the case of models as you point out right so if you're gonna uh learn from it and improve it then you might want to be able to access the training data yeah and, it, and it's been such a focus on code um right. and uh i mean i think gray was very famous in saying that that uh you know Data must have programs to be able to exist, and likewise, most programs use data. So there's really an artificial separation between them. But um, the mo the licensing has all been about code. There has been attempts toward um, there have been attempts toward uh, open data licensing. Yeah, no, uh, no one really are, shares the data, right? So it, the the private companies don't really share the data. Well, they're very pro yeah, they're very problematic because to really make open data work, you've got to be able to identify where problems are and then go back upstream of where that's being sourced so that when there are updates that come down, you, just, you don't have to like fix the data every time. That's been something problematic with the licensing of open data. Uh, and, and that'll probably continue to be somewhat problematic for licensing of open source models that are trained on data if you don't really understand the provenance of it. Um, that becomes a very big legal quandary. Whereas with source code, you could just you know, publish, here's a fork. Um, it, that it's not going to be as likely that you would publish the entire corpus uh, and and then train a model on it. I mean, I I guess we could, uh, but that that would be very expensive. So, so I think the, we've got to uh, find better ways. Right, right. So the in, in the conference, I guess what's heartening is people are excited about uh, using these open source models. And so my concern is if we're dependent on a few suppliers that are private entities. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to a point where there's some kind of effort to have a much more stable, predictable supply of open source models that you're not at kind of you're at the mercy, and you know you you just hope these private companies continue producing them or sharing them or 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 releasing them with the right license, right? So yeah, so it, 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 right it now seems... it's private companies, right? So, 
It is private companies, but it, it's also changing from being the hyperscalers um, going down towards smaller companies that are providing the models that are really getting attention. And I mean, really, uh, it, it, like we saw useful sensors. I mean, that's a team handful of people, obviously split off from DeepMind, very, very well trained. They help create TensorFlow. Um, but, you know, when they go and take and, and do uh, work with, you know, an open source model, Whisper, and then, you know, put that on a small card. Um, Supplied by a private I think company. I, it's a private company, but it's a very <laughs> small team. It's, it's No, no, no. A, I mean, the, yeah. the, the model they started out with came oh, from yeah, a private yeah. company. Yeah, 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 the start of it. So, I mean, I've been really trying to grapple with this. The analogy that I would make is like, do, do you, are you familiar with like the workstations, the sort of final checkout when you're producing a, a, a chip that's mass produced? There's a, there's a workstation that, I mean, those things cost tens of millions of dollars. And... Um, you know, I think the analogy might be that, um, you know, to run uh, chips on your laptop, you do not need to have a kind of workstation that costs, you know, $50 million just to be able to ensure that your laptop is going to run. Somebody does that. Somebody does go and use this huge, ginormous workstation to ensure that your your chips before they go through, I really even before like for silicon, uh, at some stage of testing, they're okay. And it's extremely... Uh, advanced technology, but it's only used by a handful of people. And I kind of get that sense here in LLMs. Like this is sort of the the point that that Wally could uh, use from any skills was making was like, yeah, you know, we, we, let's see, we could use Chat GPT. We could, we, if we can get the GPU servers, we could run a cluster and we could pay all that money, or we could go and and use private endpoints and use cheaper models. But then fractionally use ChatGPT for sort of the final, you know, cross check at the end of the workflow, and you get this kind of arbitrage model where the really ginormous, expensive uh, models are only being used fractionally. Um, and I mean, we can talk about that in more detail later. But I, I think that there's some analogy with what goes on with producing chips that, like, the really expensive technology only gets used fractionally. And you end up with a lot more cheaper mass produced stuff that, that actually goes into the consumer hardware. Um, I think we'll be seeing more of that here as you know, we, we find that there, there are cheaper ways to go out and do things. Do you need to ask questions of chat GPT uh, to be able to generate the code that you need? Or can you do some, some you know, few shot with, with like set fit, with, with sense transformers and just get away with it? Um, that's, that's kind of the question on the table. So... What's your next takeaway? Wow. Okay. Uh, well, you know what? So, so one thing I heard <laughs> from several directions, I run, wanted to run it by you, uh, but I've been kind of living this one. Um, it, it there was a narrative that emerged talking with a lot of people at the conference, and that is that like in about January, February of 2023, um, executives around the world started playing with ChatGPT, and there was this sort of collective aha moment. Hey, we can get enormous productivity gains and probably lay off a bunch of people, um, just because you know some billionaires have promised us super have promised them super intelligences, and and what we saw along with that, I mean, at first I thought it was just a few specific cases, but it, I think it's more pervasive, was that a lot of technology projects, the budgets were basically put on hold, and and a lot of senior people in technology suddenly were let go because you know upper executives thought they wouldn't need this anymore. They would just have ChatGPT write all the code to run their their factory. Um and and that lasted for at least about 6 months. It wasn't until executives started to uh see Q4 looming uh where you know they're going to have to produce some results by the end of the year. They're going to have difficult questions to answer from their board. Um, and, you know, now we're starting to see projects are getting more funding and people are getting back to work. But even though the headlines had said, oh, God, there's a revolution going on. Actually, uh, this is this is a real downturn in technology. And a lot of people have been going for literally like six months without revenue um, because of this kind of collective hallucination about ChatGPT. I heard this from large VCs. I, I definitely heard it from consultants. I heard it from corporate executives. Have you been hearing things along these lines or is just me? Is this just like cherry picking? So I think uh, so I, I don't necessarily hear of layoffs or uh, downsizing, but I do hear. Uh, a lot of people complaining that executives are very simplistic in in their uh, 
assessment of this technology and that this technology is miraculous. Uh, I think I hear that across the board, uh, not just at this conference, but all over the place. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, I don't know, Paco, how you feel, but maybe the onus is, uh, is on the technical teams to provide maybe a more uh, convincing explanation for why these technologies have limitations. So it could be like a presentation where you go, okay, so this is what you think this technology can do, but in reality, this is what this technology can actually do. Uh, so, so bound it, get that message going up the corporate ladder that, you know, these are the bounds. These are things we can do, things we can't do. Um, yeah, that's an important step. And it, and it, and it really hasn't happened a whole lot from what I've seen, because frankly, even though there's a lot of buzz, I think a lot of people in those kind of, of roles in large companies still don't understand how to use this or why they, they, they hear a lot of, you know, acronyms being thrown around that they don't necessarily like, what does RAG mean? What, how do I actually use retrieval augmented generation? Um, I think it's going to take a while for that to diffuse, kind of going back to like diffusion of innovation. Um, it, it, it takes a while for that to diffuse beyond the inventors to the early adopters. And I think we're still kind of in that gap. And I think, Paco, did, uh, to some extent, I think this is uh, my force this AI and data teams to kind of up their game in terms of uh, presenting to executives in the sense that, you know, you might have to create a presentation to executives that really just nails the point, you know? <laughs> so, you know, like uh, you go, okay, so you think it can do it? Let's go to chat GPT and, and, and try it. And, you know, I mean, something that really drives home the point uh, without any question that uh, what you think it can do, it can't do. Yeah, and I mean, full disclosure, I lead a team that works in enterprise. And even though we're mostly doing open source integration for machine learning, a lot of what we get asked to do is help prepare slide decks for mid-level execs to present to upper execs doing exactly that. Um, and there, there's been a flurry of that. And uh, you know, my my best advice is, is uh, find a good marketing agency that you can work with, uh, you know, and uh and 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 really dumb it down and polish it up <laughs> or, or or actually Paco, it might actually you may have to up your game so it may you can't fight this battle with slides you might have to have animations and I, and, and, and things like that right so oh well in my experience without letting the cat out of the bag actually, actually going to movie production is is extremely <laughs> valuable if you can do a, a short movie or use essentially hijack some available film uh, and put your message across real simply on top of that. Again, using real you know design studios. Um, that's the kind of thing that really conveys to uh, leading execs. It may be the only thing they understand. Um, but I think along with that, you need to have the code samples because at some point your business units are going to have to do actual work and they're going to have to see what libraries to actually call to get something done. So you you need to, I, I think that it's a two-pronged strategy. You need to be managing up with messaging that's actually bounded, like you're saying, uh, but very digestible. Um, and that's hard to do. It's expensive, but it, it it's worth investing twenty or thirty thousand dollars to do that. Um, on the other hand, you you really need to go out and find uh, you know what what are the the examples out of open models that you can use, or or maybe it's even a, a paid API you're using. But here are some clear examples of things that can be done because you know the experience has been that um, in until the business units really see it, you're not going to get a clear signal of of what they need to do or what they possibly could do. All right. So my next takeaway is something that uh, you've hinted at before, which is uh, the rise of uh, custom foundation models. So uh, uh, and multiple custom foundation models. So it could be a, a combination of uh, models that you fine tune for your own specific domain, or that you supplement with external data using retrieval augmented generation. So a couple of models that I've seen, or three models I've seen. One is, uh, uh, and I've heard about actually, I, I heard about also at the conference. The first is just straight up, I have multiple custom foundation models, right? So maybe one for HR, one for finance, and so on. So literally multiple custom foundation models. The second model is uh, 
kind of the mixture of experts model where uh, yeah. like uh, the the any scale doctor that Walid talks about where you have multiple small LLMs and you have some kind of routing logic that uh, determines wh which LLM you route it to, to, to get the best answer and uh, kind of the, at the most efficient, uh, the most efficient and best answer. And then finally, the third model I uh, talked to, so I have the discrete multiple models. I've got a mixture of experts. And then the third model I heard about at the conference uh, uh, through Igor of Meta is kind of this pipelining model where you go, I take this model, yeah. go, uh, this first LLM does something and then yeah. passes it to a second LLM, which does something else. So anyway, so the meta takeaway is multiple foundation models and there's many ways of actually uh, using them. Yes, and I, there was a keynote, actually a really good keynote along these lines. I think it came from Gradient. Uh, was that Mark Huang? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who did uh, a million models? I forget the exact title. I will have to look it up. But um, yeah, along these lines, um, yeah, the mixture of experts I think is really interesting, especially for enterprise applications where, yes, you do. And in, in fact, you need to have procurement weighing in. You need to have legal weighing in. You know, before you can actually like make a bid on a customer project, you have to understand about uh, a, a lot of issues in the company. And so, uh, if you can actually take that down to the models and like where you're doing some uh, probabilistic ensemble of, of you know vectors before you go and synthesize an answer. I, I thought that that was a really interesting approach on, on mixture of models. Um, yeah, I agree. Those are three, there may be four or a combination thereof. Um, you, you're talking about pipelining. I mean, one thing that happens a lot in, in natural language work is you, of course you have pipelining. You go out and you use, if you use Spacey to like parse a document. It's all pipelines. Um, it's, yeah. There's a lot of models. I mean, yeah. there are quite a lot of models before you, you just do one call and you you get part of speech and you, you get you know uh, uh, named entity recognition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of models. And in the later versions of this, combinations of these kind of NLP packages, now with like, for instance, Spacey LLM, there's even more models being introduced. So um, I think one of the views of this is like, if you want to do really good entity extraction from your text, you might be using not just a different model at every stage. You might be using multiple models at each stage and then kind of using that as a probabilistic mix. So like the, the routing plus pipelining. Yeah, yeah. With the, the two going to, and uh, I'm involved in some use cases that do exactly that uh, because you, you might have some real explicit ways of going after what you need, but then you want to capture the long tail by more probabilistic ways. Um, and... I think we'll see that it's if we want to call them foundation models, maybe um, pre-trained models of various form and flavor. But then also, by the way, Paco, uh, uh, I as you were talking, it just occurred to me. I actually do another form of this, which is kind of like an ensemble where I actually look at answers from multiple LLMs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is happening a lot. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you see people doing this informally, but it's also happening more formally. Um, have you have you been looking at like um, probabilistic circuits? Uh, not not deeply. No. Yeah, there's some cool stuff going on there about what is tractable. How can we mix uh, different small components together to come out with some sort of more uh, more comprehensive um, route, if you will, um, which is both tractable and expressive. Um, and yeah, exactly. Going into like these ensembles of little components, um, you end up with something that looks like a neural network, but you know, a very strange neural network that's kind of bounded in some very strange ways. But I, I think that, um, yeah, the ensemble approach, obviously that, that, you know, going back to the Netflix prize, this has been such a major theme in the practical or, or more pragmatic parts of machine learning was that we use ensembles. And uh, even some of the more, you know, popular machine learning methods like random forest and gradient boost and all that, they're, they're ensembles. Um, I, I think that this has just been a way of mitigating risk and uh, also mitigating cost. I thought that um, I, I, if we could dive into like Wal Waleed's um, talk a bit, sure, um, Waleed, Waleed Caduce was showing where essentially using ensembles of different models together, you could really lower the, the cost basis 
for your applications. And I mean, what he was showing there was like uh, running through the numbers, it was like order magnitude reduction in cost basis. And I, it really struck me that what he was showing was almost like an arbitrage model. I, I'm, I'm not the financial engineering person in the conversation, yeah. but it did seem like a kind of arbitrage. And I think that we'll see these kind of economic games being played using ensembles of, of models. Yeah, yeah, and then they actually uh, uh, they haven't uh, given a deep dive talk about this, but they have this routing uh, model in the in the intermediate layer, where they actually had to uh, uh, go through and label data in order to get that routing model uh, to work well. But uh, once they did, as you point out, then they they were able to reap the benefits of being able to use the right model at the right time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because there there are form, formal uh, approaches to this, right? I mean, in terms of like data set quality and and human in the loop, getting getting domain experts to, to weigh in on labeling your data. Um, obviously we have active learning, we have weak supervision, we have methods for being able to pull a uh, sort of mixture of experts already. So, so we have some some formal methods in machine learning for being able to control, I, I won't say control it, but being able to steer this more effectively. Um, and I, I haven't seen anybody doing weak supervision for ensemble of models yet, but I imagine it's a matter of time. All right. So uh, what's your next takeaway? My next takeaway. Um, let me scroll down here a bit. Okay. So um, I heard, I want to run this by you, but I heard three caveats for paths to ROI, return on investment, uh, for, for doing applications right now with LLMs. I heard three things being said from several different directions, uh, repeated by, by a number of people. Um, one of them, of course, is data set quality. Uh, oh, and I should say, I'm running this by you. I want to understand, did I miss anything here? Or is this, are you hearing similar? Um, but one of them is data set quality because your data set you will need to use it multiple times. You'll you you maybe you're training a model. More likely, you're using a pre-trained model. Maybe you're fine-tuning a pre-trained model, or probably even more likely, if you don't have enough data together to to you actually need a lot of data to do fine-tuning. Um, you're probably maybe doing some like few shot or maybe retrieval augmented generation when you're synthesizing. You'll be using your data for that, and most certainly, you'll be using your data sets for evaluation of, of whatever models you're using. So, you know, your, your data sets, the quality of your data sets, that comes in maybe four or five times within a workflow per model. And, and just if you bring in your domain experts to iterate on, the, on data set quality, you're going to reap the rewards. So that was like the one thing I heard over and over. Um, and I think that a lot of people, well, frankly, a lot of graduate students that I encounter in this field, um, they're mostly concerned about using some standard benchmark data set. They don't really care about anybody's individual data set. And that's a real disconnect right now between research and industry. Um, the other thing I heard was about narrow task focus. I think that um, when we go back to the, you know, like for instance, um, Eric uh, uh, Bjorn Jolson from Stanford HAI. Bryn Jolson. Bryn Yelson, sorry, my my. You know, uh, I, I I had to write out his name phonetically. Yeah, my my Norwegian is really bad these days. I don't know why. Great um, guy. <laughs> yeah, he was fantastic talk. Uh, <laughs> highly recommended. Um, and the startup also looks pretty really good. Um, I think that he was he was focusing on this as like really what you need to do is think about task analysis. Don't think about. I mean, there's a lot of discourse about like replacing people and jobs and all that. Is like. No, actually, what are the tasks you're doing? How can they be augmented? Um, and that's really what's on the table is how can we use these technologies to augment tasks? Um, and I heard from others, several others, about really the key to making applications is to get this narrow focus on tasks um, and do that up front and really you know, understand how are you going to augment a particular task that is being performed a lot um, and how are you going to measure uh, whether or not you're 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 getting better results in those tasks. So that was like the step two for ROI, and then step three was yeah, I have to scroll back down to it. Um, so you know, step three. Great, here I am scrolling through everything. Um, we, so we had um, narrow. 
Ah, there we go. Step three. Um, yeah, well, going back to what you were saying before, I had made a point that um, there's three steps of of like data set quality, task analysis, narrow focus on tasks, and using a mix of smaller models as opposed to using just sort of one size fits all with a, a very um, larger, uh, you know, super high quality model. Um, and those seem to be like how to get toward a good application and good return on investment. Yeah, on the importance of data, I completely agree. I mean, there was there's an excellent talk at the conference by uh, Danny Bixon of Visual Layer. So they're completely focused on uh, visual data sets. It was in another room, unfortunately for you, Paco. Yeah, I'll you have to catch want... the video. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you may want to watch the video. But basically, uh, uh, you know, in computer vision, there's a lot of mislabeled images, blurry images, uh, images that actually uh, are not... Uh, something you want as part of your data set and so on and so forth. But uh, they make it easy for an analyst uh, to do all of this um, and uh, uh, to, to, to get through the data. And, and basically by doing that, then everything, as you, as you point out, Paco, everything flows from the data. So if you have good data to train your model, you have better models, period, right? Um, yeah, and so one of the things that uh, occurs to me, Paco, when it comes to data is that, um, and this is something I think I may have shared with you in the past, which is uh, I think right now uh, a lot of the focus uh, in in the AI space, is, and you can see that to some extent in the conference, is in the models themselves or orchestrating the models or building tools to orchestrate uh different LLMs, right? By orchestrate, I mean things session. like yeah. Langchain, Semantic Kernel, Haystack, yeah. this, this these kinds of tools. Uh but not as many people are working on data related tools. And by that I mean look back five years ago, there was a concerted effort in the data engineering space to re to uh come up with a new set of tools that people end up ended up calling the modern data stack. Uh, for ETL, for uh, orchestration, but everything uh, that happened five years ago was optimized for structured data, so data lake house, data warehouse. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe we need precisely the same kinds of tools in this new realm of unstructured data. So there's a company called Unstructured, but that's it. That's the only company, as far, best I can tell, that's uh, focused on... Uh, ETL for LLMs or pipelines for LLMs. But you can imagine, Paco, uh, even information extraction, uh, you need, uh, we could use uh, better tools uh, for that. Because if if the hello world application in this space yeah. is retrieval augmented generation, and by the way, for most people, the hello world for RAG is a bunch of PDFs. Yeah. Right? So. I think the people take for granted that the PDF extraction tool library they use from Python is getting the most out of their PDFs, <laughs> right? So because uh, uh, every PDF is different. It's got <laughs> tables, it's got images, it's got the, the images have captions. I mean, there's a lot of information in the PDF. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and people just take for granted that, okay, I just use whatever PDF extraction tool library in Python it must be doing the right thing. And I actually fell into this trap too, Paco, until <laughs> I started uh, working on a project where I actually knew what was in the PDFs. So then you I started realizing yeah. this thing is not getting some yeah. information out of the PDFs. Well, right? it, it really kills me uh, talking to people who, yeah, sort of glaze over that part. Um, and, and so, I mean, in enterprise, when you're working with machine learning, you're putting together your data sets and you're using NLP to extract information from, you know, whatever but, 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 but are. Before, but before you continue, do you agree with this kind of general observation that not enough people are working on data tools for, yeah. for uh, unstructured data and LLMs, right? Yeah, no. And I mean, full disclosure, I, <clears throat> I an advisor for um, Argila, I've been working with Argila for six years. And, and we work with Unstructured and others and are really focused on that, like iterating on data set quality, uh, integrating with the extraction tools so that then downstream you have all these use cases for your data set. 
Um, and there, there is an ecosystem that's emerging in that area. And I mean, I think if you go back to like the CV Insights uh, AI 100 from earlier this year, you know, there's there there is a a, a smaller ecosystem that's emerging. Um, but our gate was definitely part of it. Unstructured is great, but not uh, not not yet to the extent that uh, the 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 set of startups that formed this kind of modern data stack. There were a lot of them. Well, I, I in, sort of in, put, this, in the in the structured data world, right? Yeah, no, that was actually a fairly small cohort inside of the um, CB Insights AI 100 this year. But I, I I do think that'll be growing because that's what you need to do. I mean, just in terms of our applications that we've done in enterprise, um, you walk in and a customer has 100 million PDFs and they might have to do with scientific papers. They might be patent applications. They might be regulatory norms. Uh, they might be environmental impact reports from competitors. They might be shipping manifests, on and on. They're all PDFs, and they're all in different formats. And for those who have never done it, um, PDF is based on callbacks. And so you don't actually have like a flow of text. What you have is like an XY coordinate for a bounding box, and it may have images or text. And then you have to like parse through a hierarchy of those and and run through callbacks to like pull up the text and reassemble it in X Y. It's mind boggling to debug that code. I can tell you uh, if you've ever worked with Py, Py PDF two or any of the other popular libraries uh, for PDF parsing, and the, and there have been really good tools for this, and they always keep getting deprecated, right? Like Allen Institute had a really good PDF parser, and then they pulled it. Um, there there's a few now that do okay, but. It's a hard problem. It's not something you can just solve. Uh, I mean, a lot of people kind of punt and they just, you know, scan the PDFs and run OCR because it's so difficult. Um, obviously, like Chris Ray had a big project about this, about using uh, machine learning to parse PDFs. And, and it is the problem of data in enterprise is that all the data is locked up in PDFs. And even if you know what's there, it's really hard to get it back out. Um, and yeah, I, it's I, the, I, and then now, now that RAG is the hello world application, it becomes even more front and center, right? Yeah, because you have this kind of hierarchical. I, I really like like Jerry Liu from Lama Index was showing about using um, references inside of embeddings in RAG. So you may not just use a token stream in your 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 vectors for your embeddings. You may actually instead of using just the raw tokens, you may have references to other chunks of data or to some PDF document or just some wiki of collections of documents describing your regulatory compliance. Um, and so you really want to be thinking about how can you have this kind of hierarchical approach. It's like, I'm going to make reference to these things over there. And the things over there are almost always PDFs. Um, and it, it's a real tragedy. Uh, it definitely, it, it gets to be fun parsing PDFs, but you know, part of it is just like safety concerns. Like you, you might have a PDF that describes how does a factory work, and it's actually a hard problem to figure out after you've extracted the units whether or not they're talking about metric or imperial. Um, and and that's been something that's really been plaguing NLP for a while. It's like that actually turns out to be a hard problem. Um, it should be a trivial problem. Um, you know, experts can go back and review the model's results, but when you're talking about hundreds of millions of PDFs, you don't have time. So um, yeah, I, I think this is a real critical kind of bottleneck on that that data preparation, data quality uh, of extraction and and iterating on data sets that just goes overlooked. All of this is very model centric, but it gets back to what Andrew Ng and others were seeing that the projects I see in enterprise doing well, they're data centric. All right. So my next takeaway is related to that first meta takeaway, which is the importance of. Uh, of experimentation. I think uh, that comes across in this conference that everyone is in the trial and error stage, experimentation stage. And this is not necessarily something I came across in at the conference, but this is something that the AnyScale people and I have been talking about, which is uh, take something simple, or not simple, but uh, commonly used like RAG, retrieval augmented generation. I mean, most of, most of us, most people will try one thing because it can get computationally intensive. But if you drill down with retrieval augmented generation, as we have been discussing, Paco, right? So there are many things that you need to kind of play with, right? So what data collection, what set of PDFs should I work with? Should I commission or acquire extra data sets? 
information extraction. So what tools uh, do I use for OCR or PDF extraction or web crawling? Mm -hmm. um, chunking. So yeah, what, what, what's the right what strategy? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, what's the right strategy for chunking pieces of data? What embedding model or models should I, I be using with my data? And then indexing in uh, search information retrieval, right? So should I use a vector database or just go with something existing like Postgres? Now that Postgres has PG embedding, right? So what search and retrieval algorithm should I use? Uh, most people use BM25 plus some nearest neighbor algorithm, right? So a hybrid model. But if you look through just a RAG system, uh, most people, when they're just in the prototyping stage, will try one thing, but it's clear that you're not probably going to, you're not getting the best out of your data if you try only one thing. What you really need to do is be able to experiment, so build your RAG in a principled way, and but it can get computationally expensive. So you may need a distributed computing platform. I mean, look at, for example, if you're going to try a, a different embedding models or different chunking uh, strategies, um, and you have a lot of documents in PDFs, uh, most people probably know that the vector database people assume you already have the embeddings. Well, most people don't have the embeddings. Right, right. You know, yeah. They have to embed their PDFs, and that can get really slow and expensive if you don't have access to a distributed computing uh, framework like Ray. So anyway, so experimentation, but through the lens of one specific uh, uh, system that many people in this conference were talking about, RAG, if you drill down, there's so many little knobs that you can play with. There are, and there are very few examples. Um, I mean, I think that this this conference is really good for you know people who are experts going out and showing their examples to whatever detail they can within 25 minutes. Um, one thing though that I mean you're 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 touching on here, putting on my hat, uh, uh, formerly you know doing a lot of conference tutorials was there weren't any conference tutorials. It's something we really need to do later. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, to roll the clock back to, I don't know, what, 2016, there was there was a point in the conferences we were doing back then when, like, Aaron Schumacher and others rolled in with, like, here's a really comprehensive TensorFlow tutorial. We're going to go from, you know, A to Z, and we're going to show you starting from some raw data, we're going to go all the way out to, you know, building your models and having some results. We're going to show you at least something viable at every stage, and then we'll show you a few variations at every stage. And it's that kind of hands-on experiential tutorial um, that just doesn't exist. I mean, there, there's the Hugging Face course. Um, a couple of people at the conference actually came up and asked me this question. It's like, so the, uh, the any scale. The AnyScale folks have a, a long blog post, part one, which is already 45 minutes long if you read it around the, this rag, playing around with the different knobs, and they have a notebook. So I guess yeah. you can go through the notebook and, and tweak it. But it uh, to your point, uh, it helps if you have an instructor to uh, guide you through. you through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, the AnyScale one is good. The Hugging Face one is good. Llama Index also has in their docs, they have, again, notebook-based, several different examples, of, like RAG in particular. Um, the trouble is, though, if you go out and try tutorials in general online, there's a very, very low success rate. I mean, even stuff that's been published recently, you go and try to reproduce results, it's not going to work. I mean, I, I saw an interesting study recently that of, of academic papers that publish uh notebooks to show code um even there where ostensibly you have a very structured way of here's how you can reproduce what we're doing um being able to get it get the code to install get the code to run properly get the code to run without exception uh you know when you get down to the point of actually having it run and reproduce results it was of the ones that even bothered to to uh publish code, only 3% could actually reproduce results. Um, and so like 97%, and there's a lot of other papers that are being published that don't have the code. So, I mean, you're you're looking at very, very small sliver of reproducibility. And I think it's very daunting for people when they, they sort of know in advance that you go out and try tutorials online, um, you know, just random people writing tutorials, most of them don't work. I think it's great that like 
you know, referenceable organizations like Hugging Face and AnyScale and Llama Index and others uh, are are putting out good tutorials. But you you do need you need the confidence and the Q and A. Um, I will say that out of the tutorials, even from good organizations that I've worked through myself, uh, you there are a lot of places where, like an instructor, if they're not very experienced, they might gloss over some key points that are just intuitive to them, but not to somebody coming into it. And so you really need to have that interaction with an instructor because otherwise you're probably going to get blocked. That's been my experience. Even if somebody like does this stuff, I try to run through this and like, I don't understand what they're trying to say. By the way, uh, to your point, uh, uh, and uh, we'll start winding down here, but to your point around tutorials, um, it's actually quite different even be in the before times in the, in the conferences we ran in the, uh, in the before times a few years ago, right? Because <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, right now we're in the, what I call the product hunt phase of AI, which means uh, uh, we have a wider pool of developers who are uh, uh, now can build kind of AI applications. Before, you know, I mean, uh, you still need a lot of machine learning knowledge. And I think you still do that now, but, uh, the reality is, the reality is, uh, a lot of the tools are much more accessible than uh, they were, Paco, when we were doing conferences in the past, right? So, to your point, in the past, I mean, you'd have to learn TensorFlow or PyTorch or or things like that. Now, you can uh, piece together different LLMs and you have a working prototype. So, the pool of developers, I call it kind of like the product hunt phase of AI, because. Uh, now you have the, the same teams that uh, post apps on Product Hunt, regular developers. Yeah. They're, they're now uh, building AI, AI powered apps. Now, you and I may, may uh, shirk at this and say, well, you, you still need to know a little bit about the ML to know the pitfalls <laughs> and, th and things like that. But the reality is the genie is kind of out of the bottle in terms of accessibility. Right. Sort of, sort of. I mean, I, I heard two divergent themes on that. Um, one was, yes, we're moving toward more low code kind of tools. If you want to use an LM, if you're being very model, or, or even if it's code, it's still just yeah. some APIs, right? So. And, and, and so then more people can get in the game. I heard that. What I also heard was from people who've been doing this is like, you know, accessing an LM, that's one thing. It's a very small part. There's an enormous amount of engineering that goes around it to actually make an application that's useful to somebody else. Um, and I see this. I mean, one of the things is like on inference, um, for instance, I'm hearing over and over again, inference not being compute bound, but being IO bound. And so like, you know, async IO is your friend. If you don't understand uh, how to do concurrency well in an application, um, you know, you're not going to have a low code solution to that. If you, if you can't get past that kind of programming and integration problem, um, you know, good luck doing the application. But side. you may not, uh, you may know all of that and still not know ML. That's my point. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, okay. So on the one hand, we're seeing it's very simple to access the model and get some results back. Great. But back up again, you know, the data extraction, the data quality set, uh, data set quality uh, iteration, uh, the integration of ensembles and pipelines and all that. There's a lot of engineering that goes into this at multi stages. A lot of people, even going down to the end where we're talking about revisiting some of the principles of ML ops because they really haven't been refined here yet. Um, and I mean, on a team, you can have two or three people doing all of this, but you won't get very far. You're probably going to have to have a lot more people. Um, so there's kind of a conceit in saying that, well, it's all a low code problem and we'll, we'll just, you know, people who know nothing about AI can suddenly, you know, come in and be the experts. I think they can have a lot of bearing on the problem, but there's still a lot of engineering work if you actually want to get to ROI on an application. Um, and that's not going away anytime soon. I, I, I don't really see that problem being reversed. So I, I think if we look at the full, you know, total cost of ownership end to end from like data to results and back, um, there's a lot of people involved. There's no point solution that does everything. Um, it's a lot of engineering. By the way, if you go to product hunt right now, a lot of the apps there are AI. Yo, oh, yeah, I imagine. And that's great. I love it. Um, and I, I, you know, the thing that, that this really begs is something that's been pulling, like pulling teeth in, in industry is how can you get past the innovation team that your consultancy is working with? 
the people inside the organization um, who are responsible for working with AI ops, how can you get past that to actually talk with people in the business units who know the problems they need to solve and can probably have a lot more bearing than like just the few people in the innovation team? Um, that's been a perpetual bottleneck. And I think now that we see this opening up, yeah, exactly. Go on to product hunt. You're, you're going to see a lot more people who have you know, not been in these kind of roles traditionally, um, who have a lot more bearing in the discussions of how to move forward. But again, it's 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 an engineering problem at the end of the day. It's yeah, yeah. And, uh, I guess my point here is that uh, the tutorials, that uh, the need for tutorials is probably uh, uh, just as much as before, but it's going to be a different kind of tutorial. Yeah, and because I because it's I, a different it's a different uh, uh, developer based stuff. Before it was the developers that the, the the people who go to like the Strata conference or the O'Reilly AI conference might be uh, just a subset. Now it's a broader pool, right? So it, it is very much a broader pool, and the amount of tools that you have to use is actually pretty wide. I I yeah. have yet to see any application that was interesting that didn't use you know at least a half dozen to a dozen different vendors or 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 projects, if you will. Um, I think that a lot of the tutorials that we've seen in the past in conferences were some vendor going, just use our platform. Yeah, yeah, um, one, and, one, uh, one tool. And those those days are really over. Yeah, yeah. And and just to close, uh, Great. this conference was a lot more than just LLM. So one yeah. one talk that I enjoyed that Paco hosted was Yishai Carmiel's talk on. Uh, on uh, generative AI for audio and speech. And uh, uh, to accompany that talk, there was also a demo and exhibit by useful sensors. <laughs> yeah. So I think that uh, uh, most attendees probably were just shocked by the progress in speech, right? I Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when I introduced uh, uh, Yashai, it was interesting because I was looking back at the AV crew when he put up the video demo where he changes, you know, he's sampled a few seconds of a guy from Boston talking. And instead of, you know, Yishai delivering in his really thick Israeli uh, accent, um, suddenly you get this Boston accent. And but but it's it's Yishai talking. But in, and and collectively, the AV crew, their jaws dropped. I mean, given what they do for a living, they looked at this and they're like, Oh my God. Um, yeah, I, I, that was startling. You could hear a pin drop after that happened because the whole audience was just like startled. Um, yeah. And he gave a very good overview of the state of generative AI for speech, but also I, I, I'd like to, I don't, unfortunately there's no video for it, but the useful sensors uh, exhibit was quite uh, amazing. Well, given, funny you should mention that. I actually given shot that, the video uh, for that. Yeah. Yeah. There, given there that, uh, they were stationed behind a DJ, and the DJ was so <laughs> loud. No, we, we we have videos. I I'm, I am working with that team, and we we have. In fact, I I shot one of the videos that goes out for training, but uh, and we'll be doing others too. Um, yeah, there's a fair amount on the YouTube channel for useful sensors. Um, that, yeah, that but show... at, the, at the conference, they were stationed behind this DJ. Oh right, we, so didn't, loud, we didn't have it, and you could st this thing this thing still produced. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really kind of amazing um, how you could be having a conversation in a in a noisy environment, uh, say like for instance a, a VC cocktail party in San Francisco, uh, where you literally cannot hear the person next to you. But yet here's this little tiny board uh, that can pick up and transcribe your your what you're saying um, in near in near real time. Near real time, yeah, really amazing. Um, yeah, there wasn't a session for that, but there's great demos and uh, definitely look uh, forward to much more from uh, uh, Pete Warden and team. And with that, thank you, Paco. And uh, thank you, go to AIconference.com so that you can sign up and get notified when uh, when the next conference happens in 2024.